working. Okay. Glad you're here today. We're going to continue our New Testament survey class. Uh, today we're going to do the last three Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John. Try saying the last three Gospels. Mark, Luke, and John. I struggle with that because I want to say Matthew first. <laughs> oh, wow. and it's hard to start with Mark. So that's why I pause it for it. We're going to do Mark, Luke, and John. It just seems like it's missing something to not say Matthew with it. But anyway, that's the plan for today. Uh, Monday night, we got out a little bit early. I expect for a brother to do the same today. Uh, next week, we do Acts, Lord willing. Uh, we probably won't get out early doing Acts. Acts has a lot to cover in one hour and a half class, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for each one of us that's here in this class today. And Father, I pray that as we get into this study, uh, that your spirits are with us, that we're uh, going through this material, that you'll help us to learn, help us to be aware of what you would have us to know. God, uh, help us to spend more time studying your word. Thank you that we can do this. Thank you that we can come together. Thank you for Summit. And that allows us to be here. And Father, we just ask your blessings to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And if I like to turn my phone off. Apparently, I somehow we've got a new phone, and I'm still trying to figure it out. I can turn the volume off, but if somebody calls, it still rings. So if there's another button, i got to push to turn that off. So trying to figure this phone out. One of these days I'll take a few hours and go through it, try to figure it out. You know what's going to happen then? Yes. It'll all change. It'll all change. Yeah, yeah, Nothing will work. Um, <laughs> the operating system is a change. The Gospel of Mark. What's the focus of the Gospel of Mark? It's Christ's deeds versus teaching. Mark, remember, who's he writing to? Who's his primary audience? We went through that chart. Romans. Ago. Romans. Who? The Romans. The Romans. Remember, he's writing to the Romans primarily. Romans are militaristic. Uh, they're action people. And so Mark's gospel, the shortest of all of them, is full of events more than it is his teachings, Christ's teachings. Uh, nothing like what John's got. None of the big, long soliloquies like Matthew has. Uh, very few of those in Mark. Not that there's not any, but certainly not as many. He focuses a whole lot more on what the deeds were. It's a quickly paced uh, book. It keeps right on moving. Very few slow spots in the book of Mark. Remember when we did that chart? Uh, Jesus is the suffering servant. And Mark covers a lot of the, the problems Jesus goes through, a lot of the issues he deals with as he goes through his gospel. And as we mentioned, he's writing to the Romans. And that's one of the reasons people suggest it probably is so fast-paced, full of events, as opposed to a lot of long teachings. Uh, the author, uh, early church fathers consistently agreed it was John Mark. There wasn't any question about it. Uh, no, no dispute in the early church. Remember, John Mark has another name. Uh, it's John Mark. Is Mark is the person... Uh, who's the gospel name, but we've got a verse in Acts chapter 12. It says, When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So while we call him Mark all the time, and Mark's most of the references in the Bible, uh, he's also called John. So he's John Mark. Appears simply by the way he lived. Uh, he lived around Jerusalem. Some suggest, based on that last verse, that maybe he, he his dad was dead and he lived with his widowed mom because he, he lived in Mary's house. It wasn't his dad's house, it's a woman's house. So some suggest, pure conjecture, uh, that maybe his dad had already passed. Who's his uncle? Barnabas. Yeah, Barnabas. Remember when Barnabas wants to take him and on a missionary journey with him? Barnabas, that big, powerful Barnabas fellow that travels with Paul, He's the uncle of John Mark. And of course, <coughs> Mark consists or assists Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and he leaves him. He doesn't get very far. Mark apparently gives up, gets tired. Nobody really knows exactly why. 
that he heads back home and walks away from Paul. And that's covered in this big long passage. It says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, now this, they're getting ready to go on the second missionary journey. Let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted him in Pamphylia and had not continued with him in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Not a good high water mark for the early church. Paul and Barnabas, great missionaries, great preachers, they have this struggle over John Mark and decide we're just going to agree to disagree. One goes one way, one goes the other. And in essence, Barnabas really sort of drops off the pages of the New Testament after this. The rest of the book of Acts talks predominantly about Paul, his missions, where he went, people he's dealing with. Uh, but they have this big disagreement on what to do with John Mark. Uh, apparently, as time goes by, uh, things get a little better. About 11 years later, Paul writing the book of Philemon, uh, refers to John Mark as a fellow worker. That's a very, very complimentary thing to say to him. In Colossians chapter 4, he includes the comment, John Mark greets you. So after some period of time, even though they had this conflict, uh, they're able finally to get back together. Uh, Paul's got Mark with him. And they seem to have kissed and made up. Uh, Paul gets released from prison. Uh, but Mark stays in Rome with Peter. And so Mark, if you remember, he's the one that follows Peter around more so than Paul even. Most people suggest he's writing the book of Mark based on what Peter told him. Peter's his eyewitness account that he's getting the information from. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, she who is in Babylon and most of the time in the New Testament, if you read that word Babylon, you're reading about the city of Rome, the capital city of Rome. So she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Peter was so close to Mark, he's now calling him his son. If you know, Paul does that frequently with Timothy, I think maybe even with Titus. He calls them a son, a relative. They're so close together. And so John Mark is there with Peter. Peter uses John Mark, most people suggest, uh, to write the book. Mark's fully restored. Here's one of the, maybe one of the saddest statements in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Paul's in prison. This is probably the last book he writes. He's facing death, and he writes, Only Luke is with me. You know, that has to be a sad situation. Paul spent his whole life after he left Judaism following Christ, traveling the Roman Empire. He comes to the end of his life. He's in prison. He knows he's about to die. Only Luke's there. And so he writes this letter to Timothy. He says, Get Mark. Bring him with you because he's helpful to me in ministry. So whatever happened long ago in Pamphylia, with that dispute, Paul and Mark have kissed and made up. They're doing well. Uh, Paul is asking Mark to come, uh, basically spend his last days with him. Um, again, I, I read that statement. I think how tough that has to be. You know, you spend all your time giving up everything to follow Christ. Uh, everybody deserts him but Luke. Um, I, that's just a sad statement to me. Uh, the date. There's a conflicting understanding. Early church leaders really talk about two different things. Uh, not sure when exactly Mark was written. Uh, Clement and Eusebius, they write that Peter was still alive when Mark wrote Mark. Puts it earlier. Irenaeus says Peter had already died uh, when Mark wrote Mark. Uh, he dies in 63 or 64. Uh, so somewhere around that time frame, scholars not exactly sure um, if he's writing before Peter's death, it could be as early as 45. If it's as early as 45 AD, it's within 12 years or so of, of the death of Jesus. And as you remember, when we looked at the chart and the different sources and the double sources and the triple sources and who's copying from whom, obviously depending upon which way you look at that depends upon when Mark was written. If everybody copied Mark, then he got written pretty quick. If Mark's copying from others, then he could have been written later. Uh, again, I don't think anybody's copying from anybody, um, but there is some disagreement on when the book of Mark actually was written. They don't know for sure. You know, one of the disappointments probably of church scholars, we don't have any of the original writings. We don't have anything dating any of the original writings. 
in the writings. Um, and so, except, of course, for Matthew. Remember, Matthew gives us some dates, talks about the so-and-so year of so-and-so, and we went through that little chart. Uh, but most of the other letters, we don't have any dates. We're just sort of trying to piecemeal the stuff together. Distinct comment or content, how much of Mark is unique? Remember from that chart we did? 3%. 3%. Not very much, is it? Most of what's in Mark is in something else. But there are some unique parts of Mark. And even though it's only 3%, some of it's those stories that you and I know quite well. The parable of the seed. The sowers who's going out throwing his seed on the wayside. Some on the rock, some on the path, some on the stony ground, some on good soil. That's Mark parable. Only one it is, even though it's quite well known. The healing of the deaf mute. Uh, Jesus heals that person. Uh, Mark's the only one that talks about it. Uh, the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. Uh, again, Mark, the only one that talks about that. Uh, praising Saul. Mark says a lot about Saul. I don't know if Mark was a chef or a cook or what. Uh, <laughs> but he talks a lot about Saul. Many, many references uh, to Saul in the book of Mark as opposed to some of the others. Uh, he's got... Uh, some small details. He uses the word gospel in his beginning of his book. He calls it the gospel, the good news. Uh, the others don't do that. Remember when Jesus goes out into the wilderness to be tempted? John Mark says he's out in the wilderness with the wild animals. Uh, none of the others touch on that. So there's some of these little small details. And again, if you think about wild animals, you're thinking Romans, you're thinking power, you're thinking they want to hear all this cool stuff. Well, wild animals sort of conjures up some of those ideas. Uh, he's got that statement where the Pharisees are complaining about to Jesus about his disciples. Jesus says, a Sabbath's not made for man, man's made for the Sabbath. Uh, I'm sorry, Sabbath made for man, not man for the Sabbath. John Mark throws that out there. He makes some statements, again, things that you and I know quite well, uh, but Mark's the only one that talks about them. Uh, he names blind Bartimaeus got a name in there. Not just some blind guy like in all the other stories. He's actually got a name in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's got Jesus' family. When Jesus is starting his ministry, he's out teaching, family showing up. His brothers are saying, this guy's out of his mind. You know, because you can imagine the Jewish leaders of those days as Jesus is out trying to be this rabbi, trying to bring people to him, teaching things that aren't normal to the Jewish people of those days. Uh, his, his, his family decided, oh, he's just crazy. You know, yeah, we put up with him. Don't mind him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Almost as though they're trying to deflect challenges to themselves. You know, who is his brother? He's your older brother. Yeah, but he's crazy. You know, we don't pay attention to him. Uh, John Martin brings that up and, and makes that a point. All the foods are declared clean in one of the parables that Jesus gives us. Mark makes that declaration. Mark can see what Jesus was doing was ending the Old Testament way of viewing things, that food. We can eat whatever we want to eat. Jesus is giving us that message. Of course, he writes this after Jesus has lived and died and been resurrected and the church has started, so he can look back and say what Jesus was doing back then was he was declaring all foods clean. We can eat whatever we want to eat. Not that they would have done that under the Old Testament law. Because remember, Jesus lived under the law of Moses. He wouldn't have eaten unclean food because he wasn't supposed to. But Mark could look back and say, okay, that's what Jesus was getting at. We can eat whatever we want. That food thing, that for some reason, struck me as being maybe the beginning of the, a movement from a physical, more or less physical relationship with God to a more spiritual relationship. I think that's exactly right. And when we did the Old Testament survey class, remember, the primary way God wanted to take the children of Israel and preserve them was he wanted to separate them from the rest of the world. He wanted to give them certain rules and regulations to live by that were materialistic, that were physical, so that they could be noticed as, we're not like those people over there. We don't eat certain foods. We're not like those people over there. We take the Sabbath off. We're not like those people over there. We do these things that make us separate to the eyes of the world. I think it's a very good observation. Most of the Old Testament rules and regulations or physical things. What to wear. Can't wear mixed cloth. Can't, you know, all kinds of weird things that we look at today and think, why on earth is, what was the reason for that? And a lot of people who dispute the Bible, you know, that's some of the questions they raise is, 
Who gives a hoot whether you wear a, a shirt that's half linen and half cotton? Who cares? What cares was God set up rules to separate his people from the rest of the people. And that was one of the rules they had to live by. Uh, but you're right. A lot of, a lot of stuff's physical. Pretty much the focus is on the Jewish people. What if, if the Jewish people said you could have eaten crabs? Absolutely. That's all, the, that's all the children of Israel, all the Israelites. The other nations of the world ate whatever they wanted to eat. But again, God is separating out his people. And so he's giving them certain physical, material kind of rules to live by, which makes them different from everybody else. Paul said, or Peter writes, you know, we're to be a peculiar people now. Not necessarily physically different, spiritually different. Living a life for Christ that the rest of the world doesn't. Uh, Mark's the only gospel that has the centurion there at the cross make this declaration, this man was the son of God. Uh, Mark throws that in there. The other three ignore that statement of the, the centurion. The last one. Uh, he's got the women as they're going up to the, the burial spot, going to anoint the body and do that stuff on that Sunday morning. They're asking, who's going to roll the stone away? You know, a practical question to a, a Roman world, you know, people who want to see things done with, methodically and, and with some kind of order, uh, who's going to roll the stone away? Uh, so not a surprise, maybe, that we've got that. Question about any of that? Any other observations? Simple outline, and again, you've got most of this in your notes, and as I'm going through these notes, uh, am I giving you enough to write, not enough to write, no, too good. much yet to write? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, I started off this class, if you remember, you were writing your hand off, and, and so I'm trying to cut back on that and still leave you a little bit to do, so you have to sort of follow along a little bit. Uh, but the presentation of Christ, chapter 1, the deeds of Christ, 2 through 10, and, and again, most of those in the book of Mark, if you read through there, uh, they're action-packed items, things that would grab the Roman people, the soldiers' attention of who this guy is. The suffering of Christ as the world turns against him, uh, the agony he goes through, the, the anticipation of the, the cross, and then the resurrection of chapter 16. A uh, real short little outline of what we've got. One last thing in the book of Mark. Um, how many of you heard about the challenge to the, lab, the ending of chapter 16? Challenge the challenge to the end of chapter 16. Hmm. Book of Mark, there's a real dispute on whether or not Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be in our Bibles or not. Uh, a real challenge on those verses. Uh, the abrupt ending, if you look at the book of Mark, ends in verse 8. It just stops. Most of the early translations or the early versions of the Bible, most of our ancient manuscripts, they stop at Mark 16, 8. Uh, they don't have nine uh, through the end of the book. Uh, there's four different editions that have emerged through the years. Uh, there's a short ending, and you'll notice in most Bibles, if you've got a Bible with any kind of notes in it, it'll give you an asterisk there at the end of verse 8, and it'll have either in your margin or down at the bottom a note that'll say most manuscripts don't include the rest of the book of Mark. Uh, most study Bibles will have that comment. There's a shorter ending, there's a longer ending, um, Long ending is fine in a few Gospels, none of them in any of the Greek writings that we've got. All the ancient Greek manuscripts that we have, none of them have Mark 16, 9 through the end of the book. And so there's a real challenge to the scholars on whether or not the end of Mark should be in the Bible or not. The thing that we need to understand, though, is there's nothing in those verses that's unique to those verses that would make us think, well, if we don't have those, we're missing out on something. Everything in those verses, except for one, is included somewhere else in the teachings of Jesus. What might that one be? Anybody have a recollection of the end of Mark? People follow it here in our area. So pick up and snakes to their hands. Yes, snake handling. It's in this, this passage that's not in the, most of the good manuscripts. Well, it says you can pick up snakes, you can drink poison, you can do all this stuff and have no harm. Uh, there's a lot of snake handling congregations in this part of the country. Okay. Uh, this is where they get that from. Had they not <clears throat> had the ending of Mark, they wouldn't be doing that. Um, sadly, some of those people that handle snakes get bit and die. So obviously it didn't work well for them. Uh, that is, even if it's right and it should be in there, it is not a message for you and me 
to go pick up rattlesnakes and get bit. Uh, that is not what that passage is saying. Is, can you remember a time when somebody in the Bible got bit by a snake and didn't die? Yeah. Who? It was on the island, wasn't it? Oh. Yeah, Paul, when he's dealing firewood or something, <clears throat> snake bites him and he takes it and just throws it into the fire and moves on, doesn't bother him a bit. Uh, but just so you'll know, if you study much or read much, every once in a while you'll run across this idea of the end of Mark is not in uh, the best manuscripts. And some people disagree on whether it should be in there or not. One of the reasons they suggest that is the grammar, the transition, the tone of those last verses don't match. Uh, the rest of the book. There are some unique words in those last few verses that aren't in the rest of the book of Mark anywhere. Uh, there's some unique phrases uh, that's contrary to the rest of the New Testament at all. So there's some reason why people look at those verses, not only because they're not in the ancient Greek manuscripts, but because they don't mesh with the rest of the writings either. It just seems a little strange. Questions about Mark? Gospel of Luke. Again, this is a survey class, uh, so we're, we're flying through some of this stuff. Um, what's the focus of Luke? He's going to compile a nar narrative. Says that in the beginning of Luke, says it in the beginning of Acts. Remember, Luke wrote Luke and he wrote Acts. Uh, so in the very beginning, he's telling Theophilus. Um, I'm doing this narrative. I've done some research. I've hunted all over the place. I've interviewed people. He wants to provide an orderly account according to chapter 1, verse 3. And so when Luke's order is laid out in a way that just flows maybe better than some of the others do because of the way he's writing and the purpose for which he's doing that. Remember the chart? He describes Christ, pictures him as this priestly savior. He's the ruler of the religious order that's changing the world. He's a savior, but he's also the God-man, the one we need to be listened to. He uses the phrase son of man, which the book of Daniel uses several times. And of course, when we study Daniel, and we're looking at Revelation and John's Bible study now on Sunday nights, uh, the idea of the son of man coming, a lot of references to the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Uh, Luke refers to Jesus as the son of man. Uh, sort of a playback on this idea of Daniel saying this was going to happen during the reign of this fourth kingdom. What's the fourth kingdom? Okay, a little history lesson. What's the statue that they have a, a vision of, a dream of, that Daniel gives the interpretation to? Who remembers that? Nebuchadnezzar sees this statue. You might remember that dream? Remember, he's got a head of gold, got a chest of silver, a girdle, I guess you'd call it, of bronze, and legs of iron and mixed with clay in his toes. Daniel comes along and says, here's the, here's the definition, here's the interpretation of that dream. The golden head is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Never hurts to schmooze the guy you're talking to. You're the golden head. You're the top of the statue. Below you is going to be a kingdom that's not as powerful as yours, but it's going to be there. It's the arms. It's a divided kingdom because it's members of the Medes and the Persians. And then there's this bronze midsection, which is the Greek people. You know, they travel all over the world. They do all kinds of stuff. And then the iron legs turns out to be Rome. That's the next powerful kingdom that's coming. Daniel says during the times of those kings, we see this huge rock, remember, not pulled by hands, comes off, off this mountain, comes rolling down there, smashes the thing, the smithereens, and sets up a kingdom that will never end. If you follow that statue, Rome is the time when this kingdom is going to happen. So as Christ starts his kingdom, comes in to take over the world, it's during the time of Rome. So you take Daniel's reference, Luke is, I think, bringing that forward. You say, this is what we're talking about. This is the time of Daniel's prophecy when this kingdom was going to start. He writes to this guy named Theophilus. So remember that chart, he's writing to a Greek audience. Theophilus literally means loved of God or a friend of God. So some people argue, was there really a guy named Theophilus? Or is Luke just writing his gospel to people who love God, people who follow God? Uh, nobody knows for sure as far as what that. Or both. Or both. Could, could be a Theophilus, and obviously it's written for us today, too. 
Uh, so it could be both. It could be a man with that name as well as the rest of us. Since it was a research account, it's to everybody. Certainly it is. Certainly it's, it's, it's there for us. Yes. It isn't just for him, even though even if he was the original recipient, it's still meant for us. Just like Paul writes the letter to the church at Rome, that letter still meant for us to read. So whether it was one guy or just using that name to reflect anybody who loves God or who God loves, it doesn't really make that much difference, I don't suppose. Uh, the author, again, the early church fathers consistently agree it's Luke. Now, there doesn't seem to be a bit of question about that. He's a companion of Paul. And we've seen some passages already from that. Acts chapter 16, from Troas, we put out to see himself straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Theopolis, and from there we traveled to Philippi. Notice the we, the we. We did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. Luke's traveling with Paul. There's this pronoun we that's there. Luke's writing the letter, and he's obviously involved in part of the events that he's writing about. We went to this place. We went to that place. We traveled on to Philippi. He's a companion of Paul. We've already looked at this passage. Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. It Mark, bring him with you because he's helpful to me in ministry. Luke stood by Paul at the very end of his life. Obviously, close friend, close companion, uh, somebody that, that spent a lot of time with. Uh, scholars suggest uh, he's probably from Antioch. He speculated maybe that's where he encountered Paul up there close to Tarsus up in northern Syria. Uh, maybe that's where he met him to begin with. Again, that's pure speculation. The Bible doesn't say that. Um, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr both agree. You know, Mark's the guy that's, I mean, Luke's the guy. He's traveling with Paul. He's his companion. Uh, the timing is right for people who have done much more study than I have. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 18 says, we sit along with him, the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread throughout all the churches. That's a pretty good commendation. Uh, I put here uh, some of the studies, and we won't read all this. You can read that for yourselves. Different people who are suggesting who he's talking about is Luke. Luke's this guy whose fame in the gospel has spread all over the place. Um, Jerome agrees. Uh, the epistle to the Ephesians, not a, not, not a biblical epistle, but written by Ignatius, agrees, Eusebius agrees, uh, everybody agrees. It's, Luke is the guy that's traveling with Paul. He's the guy that's writing the book, a very good, close companion uh, with him. Luke's with Paul for two years in Caesarea. Uh, there in Colossians chapter 4, read through that, the last verse, our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas sends greetings. They're there with him, they're traveling with him. Again, doesn't seem to be a whole lot of debate or question with that Luke's the guy that's writing the letter and he's a very close companion of Paul. He's the only Gentile author of scripture. Hmm. You know, we start with Moses. We're back in 14, what? 45, 40, somewhere around there. He's Jewish. He's an Israelite. Everybody else who writes a book is an Israelite. Descendant of Abraham. Except for Luke. He's the only Gentile writer in the whole Bible. And he was educated. Very educated. Yes. Apparently a physician or a doctor of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, he writes that way. His, his wording is much more orderly, much more scholarly sounding than some of the other guys. He writes 27% of the New Testament in the Greek. Uh, 37,933 of the 138,010 words. So he writes 27% of the New Testament, which is I don't know, would you have ever thought he wrote that much? If somebody was to ask you, you know, and tell you Luke wrote a quarter of the New Testament? And you know, until I ran across this little bit of information, I would never. Everybody would have said Paul. <laughs> yeah, we would have said Paul. However, Paul only wrote 23%. So Luke, even though he only wrote two books, his two books are so long that it's more than all of what Paul wrote, even though he wrote bunches of books. I read that, and that, that surprised me. I wasn't, wasn't aware of that. It was sort of a little bit of a, a surprise. The date, Acts ends abruptly in 63 or 64, and it's the second part of the letter to Theophilus. So there's some question, if he writes it while they're in prison in Caesarea, 
it's about 58 AD. If it's while they're in Rome in prison, it's 64, and he would have written it right after, right before he wrote Acts. He would have done the two almost back to back. That doesn't make sense to me because of the way you read the opening of Acts. Almost sounds like some time's gone by, a little bit of a, a lapse. And so my personal opinion is Luke's written earlier, and then he follows up with Acts down the road somewhere. Uh, but again, the scholars aren't exactly sure uh, when Luke was written, but either one toward the end of Paul's life. Obviously, he follows Paul until the end of Paul's, at least imprisonment there at the end of Acts. So he's there with him there toward the end. But they're not a little bit of a dispute on exactly when he wrote that. Most agree it's probably before 70 because there's no reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Every time I read that, I think, well, John didn't talk about that either. But everybody agrees John was written, you know, well after the destruction of Jerusalem. So I read this. And I think with a grain of salt, so what? They didn't mention it. Although they do write a lot about going into the temple, doing things. Nobody bothers to say the temple's been destroyed. Didn't talk about it in Acts either. And so most people suggest both of these, Luke and Acts, would have been done before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. But again, I'm not sure that's true necessarily. Yet, but something that should be persuasive because John doesn't mention that. He doesn't even mention it in Revelation. And everybody agrees Revelation is written about 95. And so the fact that nobody says that, to me, is one of the highlights. Um, distinct content? How much of Luke was distinct or unique? You remember? Oh, no. 35. 35. He's got a lot. A lot. His third of his book, nobody copies. Nobody says the same stuff. So 35% of his material is unique. Uh, some of the stuff that's in there, you know, that we um, know quite well, the narratives of John's birth, you know, talking about Zachariah and Elizabeth and dad going dumb because he couldn't speak because he wouldn't believe in what was being said. Um, that's all in there. What else is in Luke that's important to us that's not in the other three? It's the Christmas story. Yeah, the Christmas story. The mangers, the shepherd, all that kind of stuff. None of that's in Matthew, Mark, or John. And it's Luke chapter 2 that Charlie Brown reads, right? That's the passage in all the Christmas stories, all the little Christmas plays. If you're going to read anything at Christmas time, it's got to include Luke chapter 2. None of the other people uh, include that in their Gospels at all. And so we're, we're thankful for Luke. A lot of Christmas carols come out of Luke chapter 2 uh, that we wouldn't have, I suppose, if that hadn't been put in there. He's got Jesus being presented to the temple on the eighth day. What was that for? Circumcised. Yeah, going to be circumcised. That's what those Jewish boys did. They went to the temple, and the priest performed that ceremony on the eighth day. Luke's the only one that talks about it. It's strange to me that Matthew, who's the Jew writing to Jews, doesn't touch on some of this stuff. But Luke, who's a Gentile, doesn't really give a hoot about circumcision or any of that other stuff. He includes some of these facts that seem to be awfully Jewish in nature, uh, but he's, but he's not also a physician. He's a physician, so that's a physical thing, and that may very well be why he brings that up. He's got the 12-year-old Jesus going to the temple. Remember the family goes to Jerusalem for the feast, and they, and they all down. head home. <laughs> a few days later, they look around and, oops, Jesus isn't there. And so they have to go back and find him. He's in the temple arguing with the scholars. Uh, Luke's the only one that bothers to tell us about that. Luke takes us back to Adam, which does make some sense because he's not Jewish. He didn't care about going back to Abraham. He goes all the way back to Adam, traces mankind's existence from Adam all the way up to the front. He tells us a story about the ten lepers. What is that story? <clears throat> Come on, somebody knows that story. What is it? I can see we're going to need to do a more than just a survey class from time to time. <laughs> Remember Jesus heals the ten lepers and he says, go show yourself to the priest because that's what the law was in the days of Moses. If you got healed the leprosy, the priest had to cleanse you and give you his blessing so you could mingle with the people. One, one comes back. Yeah. Remember, one comes back. Jesus says to him, where's the other nine? Mm -hmm. you know, that's the leper story. 
a very bunch of ungrateful people. Zacchaeus. I was going to say that the leper story shows that you spread the good news and one out of ten is going to accept it. At the most. Probably at the most. Yeah. And again, I look at that just like I was said a while ago. This is a physical health issue. Luke's a doctor. Yeah. He's thinking, maybe leprosy, that something pretty bad stuff. And here's Jesus healing people of this uh, just by his word. We get Zacchaeus. Remember poor little Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior for it to see. And on and on and on, that little ditty goes. Luke's the only one that bothers to tell us about him. Luke's got some parables that none of the others do, just like the others. He's got the two debtors. Remember the one where the guy owed the king a fortune? And the king's going to throw him in prison, and he goes and begs, please don't, please don't, please help me, give me a break. King says, fine, I forgive you if you get That guy goes out, finds some guys that owes him two cents. The guy said, give me time, I'll pay you the two cents. The guy said, no way in the world, I'm throwing you into debtor's prison. Uh, Jesus gives us that parable to say, you know, if you're not a forgiving person, after all God's done for you, after all the sins he's forgiven you for, you better learn how to forgive others. Uh, a very powerful parable on forgiveness. The Good Samaritan story. You know, even the world knows this story, but it's only in Luke. Some of our laws, at least in Arizona, I don't know if they were here in Tennessee or not, it was actually labeled the Good Samaritan Law, which protected you from being sued if you stopped at an accident to help somebody, even if you screwed it up and the guy died, you could not be sued because you were acting like a Good Samaritan. And it was a protection a, from lawsuit. And that's how they titled that law, the Good Samaritan Law. Because of the Bible. The rich fool building barns. You know, he looks around himself and says, Yeah, I, I got so much junk, I don't have a big enough garage. I need a bigger garage. And so he, I'm just going to fill it up with my stuff. Uh, and of course, he gets told, You know, you better be sorry because your soul's going to be required to be <clears throat> This one is probably not very familiar to most of us. We probably skip over it a lot. It's a parable of the servant that des deserves varied beatings, and it's a story of the master who goes away and comes back and some of his servants have obeyed, some haven't obeyed, and it says those who don't obey, they're going to be beat with many stripes. Meaning some of these others aren't going to get so many stripes. Uh, but it's one of those passages in there, again, enforcing the idea, God expects you to do what God tells you to do. You know, there's grace and forgiveness for all of us, but if you're walking around thinking, you know, God's my Savior, but I don't give a hoot what he said, I'm going to live the way I want to live, uh, you're probably going to be in for rude awakening on one of these days. The unfruitful tree. Remember when they walked by and there's no, no figs on it and they all get upset and God, Jesus just curses the sucker and it dies. Um, the lost coin. I mean, here, here's a story we all know, right? The, the prodigal son. Chapter 15 of Luke. That big famous story that we've probably all heard 20 sermons on. Um, Luke's the only one that talks about it. The only one that gives us that story. And I guess part of the reason I'm going through this is it sort of surprised me a little uh, reading some of these. Each of them have their own like this. How important so many of them are to us and our stories today or the things we know, but how just each little guy writes his gospel, including little tidbits that the others don't. Uh, the shrewd steward, probably one of the most confusing uh, parables in the Bible. Well, this guy's about to get fired. He's not done a good job for his master. So he goes out to all the creditors of his master and he says to Margaret, do you owe my master $25? And Margaret says, yes, I do. And he says, well, give me 20 and we'll call it square. And then he goes to Don and says, you owe 50, give me 45, we'll call it square. And he makes all these deals. Sound like cheating to me, but he gets commended by Christ for being wise, for looking forward and using the circumstances to his advantage. The message, I think, is we need to be smart. We need not be stupid. We need to see what's going on around us. We need to act accordingly. Not cheating, not dishonesty, but the commendation is act wisely. Oh, he may have never got any money if he didn't get that. That's right. Yeah. And just, you know, he's shrewdly looking around. He doesn't keep his job. He still gets fired. Uh, but Jesus is telling you and me, look at the circumstances. Be wise in what you're doing. Not condoning sneakiness or underhandedness, uh, but being wise and being able to, to judge 
appropriately and what's going on around you. Was that of the master's awareness that he did that? No, it was without the master's yeah. awareness. Approval. The guy was trying to make friends with people knowing he was going to get fired, hoping that, well, when I get fired, if I gave Margaret a good deal, maybe she'll hire me. Uh, that kind of thing. So he's doing it for himself. But the commendation is you're being wise, you're being shrewd, you're paying attention to what's going on around you. But, he, but the master does not fire him. Master does fire him. Oh, he does. He's, okay. he's still he's losing his job. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Rich man and Lazarus. We all know that story, right? Yeah. Rich man's rich. Lazarus laying by his gate. Doesn't get anything. They both die. Rich man's in torment. Lazarus up in Abraham's bosom. Uh, big gulf between the two. Can't connect. Uh, pretty well an indication, John, we're talking about that this morning. Yeah. Some people are not going to heaven. Some people are not going to be in the good place. They're going to be in a bad place. Uh, the persistent widow and the unrighteous judge. Uh, the widow is trying to get help. You know, and back in those days, not unlike many places today, the guy with the money took, got himself taken care of. The rich always seemed to get ahead. Poor never got treated. Same thing was going on back in these days. You, you bought your way in to see the judge. She didn't have money. She bugged him and bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. And finally the judge says, you know, not for any other reason, but I just want you off my back. I'm going to do what you want uh, just to shut you up. Uh, the message is don't give up on asking God. You know, God doesn't take care of us just to get rid of us. He doesn't answer our prayers just to stop our whining. The message is ask. Ask. Don't ever give up. Uh, keep asking. Pharisee of the tax collector, go up to pray. We all know that one. You know, the Pharisee is looking around. Boy, I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm glad I'm not like her. I'm glad I'm not like I tithe. I I'm such a wonderful person. Uh, tax collector won't even lift his eyes and says, strikes himself on the chest and says, God, be merciful, I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, that one's gone home justified hmm. as opposed to the other. Humility. Don't judge yourselves by others. Don't look around at others and, and push them down and criticize them. Uh, the message of that's parable. Questions about any of that? A couple other things Luke includes that others don't. Luke before Herod. I mean, Jesus before Herod. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of his trial experience uh, there that the others don't include. Pilate proclaiming Jesus to be innocent. Only Luke gives us that. I'm really surprised the others don't because that's the, the point of the whole story is Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, but Pilate in Luke's Gospels, the only one that has Pilate saying, I find nothing wrong with this man. Um, seems a little weird to me. The road to Emmaus. Anybody been on the Emmaus walk? Jay has. I have. Uh, this is where that comes from. These guys, remember, they're, Jesus has died. These guys are walking back home, headed toward Emmaus, a little town. And Jesus joins them, is talking to them. They don't recognize who he is. I mean, if you're expecting him to be dead, you probably wouldn't. You're not looking for Jesus to be there. Uh, Jesus talks to them, finally they invite him to eat. He goes in, and when he's breaking bread with them, uh, it dawns on them who this is. Uh, Luke's the only one that talks about that, hmm. even though it's a pretty well story for all of us. A simple outline. Christ arrives. He gives a, a big four chapters. That's all the Christmas story stuff. The ministry of Christ, the next five chapters roughly, of what Jesus is doing, the rejection of Christ, sort of like Mark talks about his suffering. Luke covers it as a rejection. The crowds, the people, the Jews, they're all rejecting Jesus. The bulk of Luke's gospel is the problems Jesus had with the people and the religious leaders. And then the resurrection gets the last chapter. Questions about the book of Luke? Is there any mention, since he was gifted with, with the medical skills and knowledge, did, did, he, did uh, God allow him to heal on his missionary trips? Or is there any talk of, of that? Or I don't recall any reference to it in the, in the Acts. But you would have to think so, I would think, Jay. If, if, if this guy's got some medical training, if he's able to help people. You know, Paul had a lot of problems. Paul got beat, Paul got shipwrecked, Paul got stoned, Paul had all kinds of problems. Maybe it was Luke going along with him who brought him back to help. That may be why he needed a medical person. He was severely hurt. All kinds of issues in his life, all kinds of things he dealt with. And maybe it was Luke being there that sort of nursed him back to help. 
Bible vision. Yeah, Bible doesn't say that, that, but it's certainly possible um, that he's doing that. He's taking care of the people as they travel. I look there's no pray. specific where Luke actually was given the power to heal. No, Luke, oh, no, no, Luke, no. He doesn't talk about himself, though. No, he doesn't talk about himself. Not really once. He doesn't talk about himself once. He's got the we. We the do way. these things. He's included in the pronoun. But yeah, Luke doesn't take any active role. And of course, he wasn't around in, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, right? He doesn't come along until later, so he doesn't have a role to play in the Gospel itself. But even in Acts, where he's there doing things, ends up writing the book, other than the very front, where he says, hey, I've done all the research, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. He doesn't talk about himself hmm. in there. Other than, you know, Paul mentioning some of his writings, hey, Luke's still with me, you know, whatever. But Luke doesn't say anything about himself at all. So I don't know that he had the power to heal as far as miraculous hot power. But if he's a physician, you know, it's a point, I think, that he might have been taking care of Paul. Because Paul had all kinds of problems. Um, any other questions about Luke? All right, last but not least, the uh, Gospel of John, the focus? For everybody, the church body. Yeah, church as a whole, the evangelism of all. He's not writing to the Jews or the Greeks or the Romans. He's writing to everybody. My page flipped. Is he the one who wrote about uh, John the Baptist? His testimony about Jesus? He writes about John the Baptist, yep. Not the only one. He's not the only one, no, because Luke did too. Luke talked about the birth. Talked about his birth and some of those other things. Um, but he's He's coming later in life. Most people agree he wrote the last gospel, probably maybe even way right before he wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, but he's writing in John 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John tells us why he wrote his book. He wrote so that people could believe that Jesus was who Jesus said he was. Uh, he wants people to believe it. He wants people to read this gospel and come to understand who Jesus is, to be assured that the God we're worshiping and his son is who he says he is. And so he makes that a point. John obviously covers a lot of the miracles, uh, but he lets us know that's a whole bunch more. Somebody mentioned in Monday night class, he's writing after the other three almost assuredly. He doesn't reference the other three, except maybe in places like this. Jesus did a whole lot of other things not written in this book. He might have been able to say, but you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote about him. You can go read their stuff if you want to. He doesn't repeat a lot of stuff in his. He references uh, Jesus is the God-man. Remember we looked at that when we had our little chart. That's his emphasis. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No question about it, John declares Jesus Christ to be God. And he comes down to this earth to do the things God, God the Father designed for him to do. Uh, a lot of people don't believe Jesus is God, obviously. They don't believe he's the Son of God. If you want to accept what John says, he clearly is, and we need to understand that. The author, again, everybody, all the, the early scholars, early church fathers, all agree that John the Apostle, Irenaeus, writing about AD 150, makes it pretty clear everybody's agreed that this gospel that they're reading, John wrote it. John's an eyewitness. The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John's an eyewitness to these things, just like Matthew was. John can say, I've seen this. I'm going to testify to you. And he says that in chapter 19, the man who saw it has given testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. John says, I've seen this happen. I lived through what I'm writing about, and you can believe me. I'm testifying to you that what I saw is exactly what I'm writing, and you need to accept that. Another in verse 21, chapter 21, this is the disciple who testifies to these things, and who wrote them down, we know that his testimony is true. John just giving his own testimony over and over and over. I saw this. I'm writing down what I saw. You can believe what I'm telling you. John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
Somebody in Monday night class had a slant on this that I don't think I've ever looked at before. Uh, what, do you, what do you see when you read this? How does that strike you? Conceited. All right. And I think that's the way most of us see it. John, rather than give his name, he's just saying, well, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. Just like all the others were loved. That's exactly right. Monday night, somebody said something like, maybe he's just amazed that Jesus loved him. I'm the disciple Jesus loved. You know, he loves me. It's like, you know, he can love me, he can love you. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, and why should he love me? You know, look at who I am. He loves me anyway. Yeah. I like that better than he's just a conceited, pompous jerk who's trying to downplay all the others. I like the idea. Uh, he's able to read this and say, you know, Jesus loved me. I'm the disciple Jesus loved. Not to the exclusion of the others, but just a reference to him. Jesus loved me. Uh, I like that better. Uh, he's the son of Zebedee and Salome. James is his brother. And so he gets to see James die. Uh, at least hears about it fairly early in the book of Acts. He's a fisherman along with James, Peter, and Andrew. We don't know the jobs of most of the apostles, but we know them. We knew Matthews. Uh, most of them we don't know. Uh, he's a Jew. Most suggest that he's probably from Israel. He's Jewish. He's, he knows the customs. He knows the history. He knows the geography. John gives us a lot of that in his writings uh, in ways that the others don't. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. And so he's the most prolific of the four. Uh, although, again, Luke wrote more than anybody as far as length is concerned, but Luke only wrote two books. Uh, John wrote five. The date, again, it, it seems to be a, a, an assumption you've already read, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, you know all that stuff. You can read that for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of unique material that doesn't have any repetition. How much of John's is, is fresh? 92. How much? 92. 92. 92%. 93. 92. Nobody copies him. He's writing all this stuff on his own. And again, part of that is people suggest, he knows the other three are out there. You can go read those if you want to. I'm going to focus on Jesus and who he is uh, and pay attention to that. Much more centered. Uh, he assumes they understand the synoptic gospels, those three. Uh, there's a lot of unique material to avoid repetition. He's a statement that presumes or assumes a passage of time. We touched on this a little bit ago. In John chapter 21, remember Jesus has already been resurrected. He's there on the shore. They're eating and they're walking down the road and, and Peter is talking to Jesus and basically turns to Jesus and says, hey, what about this guy back here? Pointing to John. And Jesus says, you know, whether he lives or dies, none of your business. And John then writes, because of this, that statement, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And so John's looking back over that discussion. And he's saying, you know, here's what happened. Here's what he meant. Doesn't mean I'm not going to die. It just that's what he said because he's talking to Peter. What religious group is it that says John hadn't died? Mormons. Mormons do. Mormons still believe John the Apostle didn't die. They think that's what this verse means. And he's walking the earth today, somewhere at the age of 2,000. I saw an article last night, or not before last, that they also think Jesus came to America to to preach to Native Americans Correct. at some point in time. I, 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 While I, he was in the grave. Thank, okay, there you go, yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, that's, that's way off. But they face. got a lot of strange beliefs. Yeah. Uh, but that's one of them. They think John didn't die. He's still alive today. Is that who they pay homage to? No, no. They don't worship him or anything. That's just one of the things they believe, that he's still here. They take that verse and say he didn't die. Uh, and so he's still here. So where is he? God only knows where he is. They don't know either. They haven't found him. He's not sitting in Salt Lake City, oh, as far as they know. <laughs> as far as they know. Uh, but again, you know, it's just a lot of strange things we believe. If we're not studying our Bibles and paying attention to what they say, we can have weird beliefs as well if we're not careful. Um, Irenaeus, again, one of the early church fathers, said that John wrote from Ephesus. And tradition says that that's where John settled. He settled in Ephesus. That's one of the reasons people suggest that when he writes Revelation, he writes the letters to the seven churches. They're all right there around the book of Ephesus. These seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, 
Tradition says that's where he lived, that's where he died. He took Mary back there and, and took care of, of that. Remember when John would say, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, remember he's at the cross and Jesus says to him, take, your mom, take my mom. You know, can you imagine? He loved John that much, trusted him that much. Doesn't give him to one of Jesus' stepbrothers or half-brothers, one of Mary's children. Gives her to John. Says, take my mom and take her. Um, and he dies. And tradition says, he takes her back to Ephesus. They live there until she dies. He goes, gets thrown off to the island of Patmos for a while. Tradition says he comes back to Ephesus and lives there and dies of old age. Most people suggest, and scholars suggest, it's probably written somewhere around 85 to 95, 80, soon before Revelation, maybe before he's thrown in the aisle, maybe while he's there, nobody knows for sure. Uh, again, 92% of it's unique. It's more centered on the Judean ministry. We're not going to go through the 92% that's unique. We'll be here all day. <laughs> the others, with a little bit, we can talk about. Most of John's unique, if you read through it. It's more centered on the Judean ministry. Remember we talked last time about how Jesus' ministry was divided, starts in Judea, goes up to Galilee, comes back to Judea. John focuses almost entirely on the Judea time frames and the things that happen here. He's the one that mentions four different Passovers, which is why we believe Jesus probably his ministry lasted somewhere between three and a half, pushing up to four years, because there's four Passovers in there in the three years. And between those four, and then a little bit on either side. Much more theological content. A lot of long references and discourses. You know, the upper room, starting in chapter 13 through 17, Jesus does a lot of speaking in the Gospel of John. If you've got a red-letter Bible, uh, much more of John is red-letter than the other three. A lot of Jesus is talking. Uh, more God-breathed commentaries uh, from John. John makes comments about... Here's what that meant. Here's why that happened. Here's what Jesus was talking about as he's writing 60 years later, looking back over these events that happened. Um, questions about John? We're not quite done. Almost done today. Anybody ever heard of a tetramorph? I haven't either. Okay. It means four images. Learn something, get ready for this class. Uh, there are church fathers who have made designs of the four Gospels and creatures to look like the four Gospels. They took them from Ezekiel and from Revelation. Uh, the standards, uh, Matthew is a winged man. Mark is a winged lion. Luke is a winged ox. And John's an eagle, winged obviously. Why they did this and what the point of it is, I have no idea. Uh, but church history, tradition, has done this for these four Gospels. Um, you can look and find several. I Googled that and found all kinds of stuff. This is some church's stained glass window. And they've got the different creatures representing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, another uh, picture with Christ in the center and the four Gospels surrounding him. Uh, again, more pictures from ancient church uh, places. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with the symbols there next to them. Another carving and engraving, Christ in the middle, the creatures on the four corners. Again, representing the four different Gospels. If you'd like these slides, I'd be happy to see if I could email them to you. Uh, another one, this is almost a wood engraving, uh, again, of the Gospels, four writers. I was just, see, I, didn't, I had no idea this was out there somewhere until I was doing this and read through that and found that stuff and thought, well, that's sort of interesting. Um, I don't know why. It's there, but it is. So now you know. Ancient church fathers took those four Gospels and made pictures of them and creatures out of them and used them in one way or another uh, to sort of symbolize those different Gospels. So if you now somebody asks you about, well, which one of those Gospels had the bull? And you're thinking, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, well, I care. Well, it was Luke. Okay. But you probably not going to remember that, but I just thought I'd throw that out there for you. A little bit of a tidbit. Uh, question about any of that. We're about done with today's lesson. I'll give you some free time today. Next week, probably won't get any free time to try to cover the whole book of Acts. Maybe over. <laughs> an hour and a half. We won't go over. We'll stick to the hour and a half. I'm committed to keeping your time for you. 
Um, if we don't have any questions about those, all four have a comment of wings. Yes, do they have connotation beyond what we would, uh, would think? Is there something about wings? I don't know that there is. Again, they take the symbols from Ezekiel. Remember the, the winged beast and the, the visions that Ezekiel had? And in Revelation, there's all these creatures and everything's got wings, everything flies. Almost sort of makes it sort of heavenly, angelic kind of something. It's the only thing I can imagine. I didn't find anything that suggested why they came up with these four different things. Um, I don't know. The, what, is that their mode of transport? Is that the way That's how they would get around? around? Yeah, I suppose so. They, they fly. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, nothing I found other than the pictures. Mm -hmm. Didn't find anything that showed where all this came from. Why did somebody make this up to begin with? I have no idea. Some of the early church fathers did that. A lot of early church fathers were into I icons. But one of the big church splits that became the big battle between the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox Church was whether or not you can have icons, statues, symbols to represent stuff. So my gut feeling is this is probably from the Greek Orthodox Church as opposed to the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. Uh, but that's just me guessing because they didn't say that either. Anything else? Let's pray. God, thank you again for being with us today. Thank you for Google and and the information that's out there, and God, that we can look it up and find it and study it, put it together. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for each one that's here this afternoon. I just pray you protect us, keep us safe, uh, and look forward to class again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Uh,